Thank you, Dr. Carr. Uh, next, we've got Dr. Duncan Green. Uh, Duncan is the Senior Strategic Advisor at Oxfam uh, Great Britain and author of How Change Happens and From Poverty to Power, How Active Citizens and Effective States Can Change the World. He also authors the From Poverty to Power blog. Duncan was previously Senior Policy Advisor on Trade and Development at DFID, the UK Department for International Development, and a Policy Analyst on Trade and Globalization at CAFOD, the Catholic Agency for Overseas Development. He is also currently a professor in practice at the London School of Economics and a visiting fellow at the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex. And you. I increasingly hate listening to that because it just makes me feel really old, um, but um, never mind. Um, so thank you very much to MCF, to Grant Thornton. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I've sort of torn up my script a little bit after listening to the first few presentations. So um, International Women's Day makes me think a little bit about the issue of measurement and the limits to measurement. So I'm going to be a bit heretical here, okay? So um, Oxfam, one of Oxfam's priorities is women's empowerment. Now, women's empowerment is actually extremely hard to measure. And if you were a small charity trying to work on women's empowerment, it would be very easy to feel totally intimidated by the idea that you had to somehow measure in a rigorous way women's empowerment. And you might well end up not doing women's empowerment. You might end up giving out bed nets, vaccines, school textbooks, just because it's easier to measure. And I think there's a real danger about the conversation about measurement and impact. I'm not against impact, absolutely. But the realities of measuring impact can distort what you do so that actually you start, you, you stop counting what counts and you merely count what can be counted. That's a sort of rough paraphrase of something very complicated Einstein said. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about a different approach. So if you think about how change happens and then come back to thinking about measurement and impact, I think you end up in a different place. So I'm going to sort of, how do I do this? I'm going to skip through a load of stuff on power, which isn't relevant, and talk about the cake. Um, so this is, and this is all based on a book which is free online, and there's a copy at the back which you're not allowed to nick, but um, that you can have a look at. Um, so to make a cake, you need a recipe, you need ingredients, and you need an oven. And if you follow the recipe, and the ingredients are okay and the oven works, you can predictably produce a cake. If you get a cake, you can attribute that cake to your cooking, to the fact that you follow the recipe. Right? It's an essentially linear system with prediction and attribution. This is the project. Okay? This is our business. We do projects where you say, we're going to do this to achieve this, we're then going to measure it, and we're going to attribute what we find to our, uh, our actions. And we're applying cakes in situations like this, okay? So this is a famous leaked US military PowerPoint. Don't see one of those every day. Um, 2009, General Petraeus in Afghanistan asked a consultant to do a stakeholder mapping to help the US improve its strategy, right? The consultant did a very good job, actually, and produced what is effectively a complex system. A complex system has specific characteristics. It's a system where lots of different actors respond to stimulus and, and messages from lots of different other actors, and they're all interconnected in a web. And the quality of a complex system is if you poke this system with money or 10,000 US Marines or whatever it is, effects will ripple through the system, and you cannot predict, however smart you are, however big a computer you have, you cannot predict what will happen. And if change happens in this system, and these systems are very volatile change all the time, you cannot be sure why. Now, this is life. Okay? This is what our own lives are like. This is what it's like driving across London. You, know, you don't get into your car and think, right, where's my log frame which sets out my speed of uh, travel and my direction of travel from now until I get to the other side of London, or you will die very rapidly. You, you respond to feedback. You, you make it up as you go along. It's all about thinking on your feet and responding. But the cake model in our heads says, no, 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 we need a good, clear project with lots of measurement and lots of attribution. So I think there is a fundamental weakness about the way project mentality has become ingrained. So the book is essentially saying, well, OK, if we start with Afghanistan rather than with the cake, what do we do differently? So let me give you a few thoughts. Key features of change in complex systems. 
So change is not smooth. Change is not the nice linear model of our project plans. Change happens in big spikes. Brexit, um, Donald Trump, you know, big things. Sometimes windows of opportunity. At the moment, they all seem to be windows of threat, but they're, they're, they're definitely critical junctures, discontinuities, right? So, and these can be large scale or small scale. If you talk to communities about how they have changed, how things have changed in those communities, you will find moments of struggle, sudden appearance of a new technology, a change of leadership. These are these critical junctures at small scale replicating the same dynamic. Now that has a big implication for how we work, how we measure. A lot of it's about our ability to detect, predict if possible, but otherwise detect and respond to these discontinuities. Otherwise you just blindly carry on with your project plan, you're going to miss a large part of what actually drives change. Path dependence. Every place is like Afghanistan, but every place is different. Everywhere is the product of its own history. So we have to be very skeptical about blueprints, about, well, this worked in Tanzania, so let's try it in Malawi. Um, you've got a real question about whether, to what extent things have to be adapted before they become relevant and useful in whatever new subject or place you're working in. So the book argues, and I am, I am summarizing a 250-page book in about 10 minutes, so I'm going to have to skip a bit. But the book argues that what we need is a new approach to thinking about change and our role as change agents. And it applies to how we think and, and, and the questions we ask. And the cartoon, I think, is absolutely essential for everybody working in the A business. I don't know if you've seen it before, but equation, 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 and then the little Venom miracle occurs. I think it should be a bit more explicit in step two. Okay, so I, I, I love that cartoon. Um, because every Oxfam project plan I see basically looks like that. But instead of then a miracle occurs, we just have a little arrow. Right? So whenever you see a little arrow on someone's theory of change drawing or someone's project plan, just say, What's, what are the assumptions behind that arrow? Because it really is never just a, you know, a, a this, then that kind of relationship. So if you start with Afghanistan, then an essential quality of anybody trying to bring about change is curiosity. The, the system is changing all the time. You cannot know it in advance. It will become clearer as you work there, as you, as you, as you mess up and learn by experience. So how curious are you? How aware are you? How interested? And how do you incentivize that in your staff? So is it the, yeah, the case, as in many NGOs, including Oxfam, that all the interesting political conversations take place in the restaurant after work, and all the boring conversations about log frames take place in the office? Or can you flip that so that the important stuff about the context and how the context is changing takes place as a genuine part of the work? Humility. You will always be in a fog. You can never know what is going to happen. You can never actually predict change. So therefore, you have to be it's a form of evidence-based humility where you actually have to accept that and work with it. It's very difficult, actually, because we're required to be clairvoyant in terms of our fundraising. Um, uh, but actually, you can't. So you have to accept that ambiguity and uncertainty as an essential, actually, quite, once you embrace it, it's kind of exciting. But it goes against the cake mentality very, very profoundly. Reflexivity. So the earlier part, which I skipped because of time, was about power and our own power and being aware of our own power, the impact of our power on the system, the impact of an all-male panel on a room which is actually mainly female. You have to be aware of these things. Okay? They change what, what, what can be achieved or what is not achieved. Um, multiple perspectives, not always talking inside your filter bubble. You know, I'm particularly excited about being here because I'm an, uh, let's be honest, I'm an atheist who used to work for the Catholics and I'm fascinated by the role of faith organizations in, in, in development. It's massively under, n not understood, not appreciated by a very secular development business organizations like DFID. Uh, Oxfam was set up by Quakers but has somehow secularized. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited about seeing this because I get new perspectives. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in Zakat and in, in a whole bunch of the other issues to do with um, uh, the, the kind of work your organizations are doing. So, Embracing multiple perspectives. And then the questions we, keep ask, we should be keep, keeping on asking. Are we actually changing policies? Very hard to measure impact of changing policies. Are we, measuring, are we changing practices? Much easier to measure. Are we, are we trying to change social norms? Are we trying to change attitudes to women, attitudes to children? 
very hard to measure. We, can, we think we can do it. Oxfam is a big organization which can invest in this sort of stuff. We th we've spent years trying to develop what we think is a rigorous tool for measuring women's empowerment. It costs about $20,000 per project, which in large projects is, is feasible. But that's the luxury of being a large INGO. I mean, it's actually very difficult to do this stuff, uh, and it takes time to invest. And I'm afraid a lot of the, the, the measurement specialists are not really interested in this space. They're interested in things which are more easy and straightforward to measure. So how do we get to counting what counts and getting more people involved in that exercise? Precedence, where has it worked? There's, there's a really interesting um, distortion in the aid business where the aid business is concerned with gaps and deficits, things we can come in and fix, things we can solve. And there's a whole different approach, which I think has got, in some ways, more potential, which is asset-based approaches, saying, where are things working? Where can we find the positive deviance on any issue where something is actually working OK in those communities or, the, or, or, or those countries, and build on that, rather than always come in with our um, white savior complex, in the case of Oxfam, um, white savior complex kind of uh, approaches where we think we can come in and fix stuff. Um, Power, I think, is the underlying force field of development. It's the uh, most social change processes when you look at them in detail. It's about a distribution, a redistribution, a renegotiation of power. So understanding the different forms of power and how they work is absolutely essential. I didn't have time to talk about that, I'm afraid. But then the final thing, and this is all the rage in the aid business at the moment, is whatever you start doing won't be what you finish doing. Whatever you start doing is a best guess You'll learn as you go. The situation will change. So how good are your feedback systems? How good are you at standing back every three months or every six months and saying, so what's going well? What isn't going well? What's changed? What do we change in terms of our indicators? What do we change in terms of our actions, strategies, tactics? And it's safe to say this isn't working. You won't get told off. And it's a safe space to have those conversations rather than the, yeah, and the, the caricature of a classic uh, NGO project is you do all your thinking up front. So you can raise the money for it. You then stop thinking and start doing for three years. And at the end of three years, you start thinking again. You get an evaluation person to come in and tell you why it didn't work. Okay? That is not the way to work in complex systems. That is a, a big mistake. So I'm going to stop there. There's just some thoughts. Um, but there's constant conversation on my blog if you like reading blogs. Um, and thanks very much.